Hey everybody, how you doing? Dave Fenoy here. Another Wednesday, another Ask Dave Fenoy Anything. And uh, once again, a reminder, connection open. Uh, Source Connect seems to be running everything, but sometimes it doesn't run. And uh, you might want to have some backup, and that backup ought to be connection open. All right. Uh, oh, also, uh, if you are someone who watches Ask Dave Fenoy anything and you missed one or two or a few, or maybe this is your first time but you'd like to go back and see some uh, others, uh, just visit my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training, and they all live there. If you're somebody that would like to uh, take some voiceover classes or uh, private lessons with me, visit my website, DaveFenoy.com. Study VO is the tab to click at the top, and you can uh, get yourself booked. All right, let me introduce my guest, uh, just an amazing woman, uh, one of the sweetest people in the world, and also a major, major talent, uh, Miss Debbie Harada. How are you? There you are. <laughs> <laughs> So good to see you. Good to see you. Award-winning talent. <laughs> how, how, how much hardware do you have now? Is it door stops all, all, all <laughs> over your house? Uh, huge paperweights all over the house? Or... <laughs> yeah, they'll probably become like bowling pins if I ever have grandkids, you know. But I, I have six. Oh, uh, there you go. There you go. I have six, yeah. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Um, oh, yeah, I... And, you know, and uh, also I should let people know that you are somebody, you don't live in Los Angeles or New York. Uh, you're in the Pacific Northwest. And mm -hmm. uh, once again, uh, I mentioned that because uh, it used to be, oh, if you're going to have a successful career, New York, Los Angeles, maybe Chicago. Um, but the world has changed. And you can have a wonderful career from just about anywhere you can get high-speed internet. Um, so that said, uh, did you have a busy day today? I did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> were you working well, on anything you can mention? Well, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, but it was busy. Oh, good. Good, good, good. And uh, as I'm looking behind you there, I think I see a 416. Is that that? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Now, is that your favorite mic? I do like it. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's the one favorite. I use most of the time. I was doing some teaching earlier today uh, through uh, VoiceOver Extra with J. Michael Collins uh, on promos. And uh, uh, he had, it was in his studio overseas there, and uh, he had his manly uh, reference. <laughs> and I have one. But I keep coming back to my 416 all the time. I know. <laughs> it just, see, I, I, you know, I can't get rid of it. It's like, no, nope, eh, that's the one. Well, listen, yeah. enough about that stuff. Let's no, talk about you and your career. How I'm always interested in how people got started in voiceover. What was your path? When did uh, the voiceover bug hit you? And uh, how did you know you were going to do well? Well, you know, I didn't ever pursue voiceover. Well, in the beginning, voiceover as a career. I majored in communication arts at Gonzaga University, and they had a division, a new internship in my senior year for TV and radio station, an NBC affiliate. Mm -hmm. And I said, I told my advisor, well, I'm not really interested in television or radio, but do you think I should apply? He goes, yeah, you don't have to do it for a living, but you know, I think it'd be good for you. It would round, round you out. So I took it and I was put in the promo department as a writer and producer. And this one woman who was in that department quit, kind of got fired. I don't I never know, but she was <laughs> gone. <laughs> and I was asked to do her job. So I did. And so I was writing and producing promos and the staff on the um, FM and AM stations of this NBC affiliate apparently were mad at her or something. I don't know, but they said, we're not doing any promo work. We're not doing any of it. And I, 
I mean, I was like 20 years old. These guys were like in their 50s. So you, you, was... were, you were writing scripts and they were just telling you, I'm sorry, we're not doing right. your scripts. Exactly. Now, was, it, was it something they had against you or this woman, which uh, I think uh, it was trickled, this woman. But they, they yeah. just lumped you in with her. Or, yeah, they lumped me in with a, her. Or was it a sexist thing that they, <laughs> we're not doing any scripts written by any women? Well, it well maybe they could have. It, I, I don't know about that because I went to my boss and I said, what do I do? Because, I mean, I wanted to keep my job. <laughs> and <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> so he goes, go to the, and he basically, he was really uh, like a feminist, you know, mm -hmm. he, he had two women in his department. And so he said, you, he said, go to, go to the program director. His name was Chuck Eaton and tell him I sent you and to have, go to one of the announcers and teach you how to do this because you're going to start doing some of the promos. And I said, so, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's how I got into voiceover. Wow. 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 So your boss, uh, did he have a crush on you? No. Okay. Okay. Well, good. He was just a good guy. He was a good guy. Excellent. And so <laughs> Did you have an idea that you would be able to do this? What What was it about you that he thought, yeah, she can do this? Because... No, I, that's a good question. I have no idea. You know, I hear... I really people, had no idea. You know, uh, uh, teaching, I run into people with fantastic voices all the time. And then you put words in front of them and, okay, well, I guess that's not going to happen. Uh, yeah. And then other people, whatever the voice is, and just sing with it um so what was it about you do you think well i think really i do think he wanted to give me the opportunity if it didn't work out he'd say well you know it would work itself out or uh but i happened this program director put me with a really nice announcer who was a really nice guy and had a beautiful voice you know, really resonant, just, you know, great, great radio voice. And he was very kind to me. And he took me into the room, his studio, which was about this big. And he sat on one side of the glass and I was on the other side. And he just told me to think back of a time when I heard a story that really made me feel something mm -hmm. and think of the person that told it to me. And then I got that in my mind. And then he gave me the copy and he said, okay, think back on that person. And after you do now read the copy. So I really thought of my mom reading stories to me when I was a little girl oh. and it was really, my mom was a single mom. So those times at night when we were, before we go to bed, I think most kids have a special memory of that if they're lucky enough to have someone read to them. But, um, I really did, but my mother had a beautiful voice. Her her footprint was even it was just listening to her was so melodic and she was she actually really was a huge talent, but she didn't she was just a mom and she didn't act like that. But anyway, so that's what I did and I just read it and he goes that's all you have to do, stay in that lane and you're going to do okay. And so I was scared to death. But that's what I did. Hmm. And and so, but on the promos, as we got further into them, when you had to have the announcer read because it was in 1973, and tonight, <laughs> and um, you know, you did they did kind of teach me that style, mm -hmm. and so I did that because it was my job. But that I'll never forget what Dave Rogers, the announcer, had said to me. And now that's what we hear now so much. You're you're telling the story and to feel the emotion. Well, God bless him uh, Truly. for telling you that. But clearly, somebody recognized something in you um, that I think it's hard sometimes to just recognize that somebody's going to be able to step into a booth, take some words, and I, as I call it, take the words off the page and tell the story. Uh, so many of us are really caught uh, in the reading of the words and not what's beyond the words. Uh, and I, I loved what he told you about 
think of somebody uh, that you care about and and those memories and how you feel about them and now bring that to the story. So mm -hmm. how, how long were you doing, uh, pro and what kind of promos were you doing? Or were you telling well, in stories? Those, in those days, I so, so there was an AM and FM uh, radio, they were a, an AM and FM radio station. So I had to produce promos that were put on the air, the television station, which was NBC um, Channel 6 in Spokane. So I had to produce things that brought listeners to FM and AM stations, according to their programming. And then I had to create the radio promos for the network shows and local television, you know, that played on the radio. Mm -hmm. So, so do, you, do you remember any of them that you, uh, any of the copy that you produced? What, what some of the things you might have said in one of those? I mean, oh, I, one I'm, of them. Was I'm just, trying. I'm trying to get you to do. give me a little promo. Okay. Well, I don't know because it's corny. This one was so corny. But my boss, maybe he was just insane. I don't know. He was. He said he wanted me to uh, promote the FM station, which was basically rock. You know, kind of rock and roll, soft rock or something. And I had, so what I did is I, this was an on-camera thing, promoting the radio station. Mm -hmm. So I sat on a stool with my back to the camera. Uh -huh. So it just showed the back of my head. And and I said, you know, at something like FM 100 is really the best place to hear XYZ and XYZ. And I suggest you tune in tonight. And then I just turned around and it was so corny. I had a clown's face on and I said, because we're not clowning around. And then I laughed <laughs> and I took it off. <laughs> and that's, I know it was so stupid. I thought I, I thought he was going to go uh, next, but he goes, I love it. <laughs> I was like, you don't love it. But he did. And he started airing it. Wow. So then I, I, then I, so then what happened is in a year, I was doing that stuff for a year and a half and they promoted me to a full-time announcer. So I was then on the announcing staff. I went from promo to the announcing staff for the TV and radio stations. And what was that like? How long did you do that? I did that for about two and a half to three years. And I had some remarkable experiences. You know, I was, I mean, really young, 20, 20, just barely 21. And I grew up in a small community of 17,000 people. And I wasn't really... Uh, you know, exposed to the arts and things and movies. We never had money to go to movies. And I remember uh, I was taking a nap in this little nap room they had for my lunch hour. And I hear this, uh, we need you to do an interview. Oh, I said, okay. And you're interviewing Mercedes McCambridge. And she had won an Academy Award. Um, mm. I really didn't know who she was. I was going to say, who is she? <laughs> I know. Well, she was in The Exorcist. She was the voice of of uh, the of devil the, or the head the... spinning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I said to her on the air, I said, um, Ms. McCambridge, I am really sorry. You know, you didn't have the internet then. And I had no time to research her because they called me and I, I said, but... I don't really know who you are. If you bear with me, I'd really like to find out more about you and what you do. And she was so kind to me. And we had a beautiful conversation on the air and the program director of the television station, he was the, well, he was, he was not the general manager. He was the program director of television programming. And then there was a director that worked there his name was homer mason and he said it's the best interview we've ever had now what do you think made it so good because it was honest okay and we got we got into the feelings yeah yeah and the realness of the feelings okay you know so that's what it was and then i did other things i did on camera i started um doing the five minute newscast in the today show and i was scared to death Nobody this was taught this me was the about local... reading this was the local, so you're not on the yeah, national. Yeah, the local breakaway. Yeah, 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 the local breakaway. And now for local news for five minutes and then come back. and they couldn't. But it, was, it started to get me on the air. 
And I and, had no training at all, none. You know, it, it, it's interesting uh, that basically you were handed this career. You just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and somebody took an interest in. Uh, they had a need. You happened to be there. Oh, here, you can do this. Right. Uh, uh, as I hear the story, I think That's of right. the number of people uh, who are probably pulling their hair out right now. I've been trying to get into a place like that for so long. And and sometimes that's just the way it happens. Um, my story of how I got an agent is very much like that. I was taking a class in Northern California and there was it, it was an agent that was teaching. It was a two-day workshop, uh, 1989. And at the end of it, she handed me her card and said, you know, you're really talented. We'd love to represent you at SBV uh, if you move to Los Angeles. And I was a morning jack on a music station there, so I, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do this one day. Uh, three months later, the whole st staff was fired, and it was like, where's that card? I, no, oh. I put it, found it and uh, came down a few months later, and it's it's been my career ever since. Uh, so. Wow. You, you spent a number of years uh, in television and doing promos. When did you start doing commercials and narration, uh, the kind of thing that we know you for now? Well, I started to do commercials at the TV station and the radio station because I had to do, you know, you do a lot of thing, everything at a local radio station in the small market. Oh, yeah. Back then, I don't know about today, but um, then... I went, I, I, with that job, they put me in this slot when I worked at KHQ, when I was, I was just, it was, I was dying. It was a, I had to go to work like at three and I worked into the early morning and I just, it was so much against my natural circadian rhythm. I just, so I three o'clock like in the, this. three o'clock in the afternoon or three afternoon, in the morning? Three oh. o'clock in the afternoon. And then it, so I guess we would go like till one in the morning. Oh. <laughs> and it was horrible. And I was in my 20s and I had no social life. And I was just this, I was really like a mole. And so, so I, it was kind of like, it. A, it was kind of like uh, the lockdown and the pandemic. Right. <laughs> I said, let me out of the lockdown. <laughs> they wouldn't. And I, so I, I had to, I said, well, I'm going to go back and get my, you know, I guess I'm not meant for this career and I'll go get my master's in communications. And I applied to Washington State University and was accepted to do it. And I could make more money selling cosmetics at a uh, Bon Marche, which is now Macy's, than I made there. And I need to pay for school. So that's where I went. Interesting, but, you know, I hate because, it. Interesting, uh, because uh, when I think radio, uh, I, I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, you're doing pretty well. You're on the air. You're doing these things. But smaller markets yeah. don't pay like the bigger markets. If you're in San Francisco or uh, D.C., New York, L.A., Chicago, you're, you're doing okay in radio. But uh, the smaller markets, not so much. You can get stuck there, too. Oh, people but I do. had it. Yeah, and there's I mean, some and very, I, very talented people who, if right. they had the opportunity to be in a major market, uh, could do major work. Right. So what happened is I hated it. I hated at looking for lipsticks. Like, is it your lipstick? I mean, I looked and I, and I made like I, two cents. I would know nothing about that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> or bad. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But um, anyway, I, I really did. I said this prayer to God. I said... Dear God, if I am making the biggest mistake of my life, you have to intervene because I'm just doing the best I can down here. And literally a week later, a friend of mine, Greg Herschel, that I went to Gonzaga with, his grandfather, by the way, is Gene Herschel, who the humanitarian award for the Oscars. Ah. And I didn't know he was in royalty family of Hollywood. We were just good friends and he was in radio. And he said, hey, the pro he came to the Seattle market. So I was still in Spokane. He said, um, the program director at our FM station, KISW, he's really like a hardcore camper kind of guy. And he was out up in the Winthrop Mountains 
camping and they don't usually get FM airwaves up there, but he heard your last newscast on Q98 and he wants to interview you to be the news director at KISW. Oh my goodness. So wow. I said, he goes, the, the airwaves were bouncing off the ionosphere and he heard your last newscast. <laughs> I go, you're kidding me. You know, so and, they, interesting, interesting. And uh, uh, Joe Cipriano has a similar story. He was on the radio doing okay here in LA, but uh, somebody from uh, Fox heard him on the radio and said, this guy would be great at promos. And, and the rest is history. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So now you you're you you're going to be the news director, and you're yeah. s- you're still in Spokane, or I went to Seattle, so I came. Ah. I, they hired me. I came to Seattle, so that was a uh, bigger market. Moving to and the middle sized city, and so we were. It was owned by Danny Kay and Lester Smith. Well, you know who Danny Kay oh, is, yeah. the entertainer. Yeah, and Les- Lester Smith was a Seattle businessman, and um, he brought our professional baseball team here, and he was really. And they own K Smith Productions and yeah. a lot of radio stations. So, how how much voiceover work were you doing, or on camera work were you doing as news director here? Well, this was the FM station. This was just ah, okay. for FM. So I was I did all the newscasts. So I had to get up, you know, be at the station at like three thirty or four for the first six fifteen newscast in the morning, and then after I was done with that morning shift by ten. Then I had to do like I I had to do the voice work for commercials and help write the staff write commercials. Which is interesting because uh, so often if you are the news person, they don't want you uh, right in sales. They don't want you selling product. They they feel like this takes away your credibility, and in some ways, perhaps it does. Uh, right. But but because it was medium sized market, uh, we're going to get more out of you. Yeah, that's right. We're going to we're going to bleed every penny. Well, so my ratings when I was there, I tripled ratings. And so um, but I always had that ethical question because I really love doing the news and I really love presenting it, the facts and you make up your decision about the story instead of this is what the right or this is the wrong view. So um, I really was careful about the commercial stuff I did. But um, so anyway, there came a point, I did this one thing, you know, we had the AP wire, no internet. So the AP Uh, wire, rip and read, rip and read. And so there was these stories coming about a little girl. They, this mother couldn't find her little girl today. It's called the Amber alert, but they kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And so I uh, just did one, I just put it in. 20 seconds of one of the newscasts and the program director coming to work heard it and he called me into his office and he said, don't ever do that again or you'll be fired. Did he give you a reason? Yeah, because the listeners only wanted sex, drugs, rock and roll. Boy, was he wrong. So I said to him and, and, you know, and he, he did, he meant it. He meant it. And I said, well, I can't work here. And I quit. Wow. Yeah, and and I quit. That affected you that much? It did. Okay, and now you you talked about it. You talked about praying to God and and, uh, he made a little miracle happen for this guy to hear you while he's up in the mountains where he can't get a station. And now you just, "Mm, I'm walking away from this, I quit. And what was the next blessing? Well, the next thing was really and truly, they did want me to move to San Francisco and then LA with their sister, with their sister stations. And I was like 24 and I was really a really immature 24. I mean, not image. I mean, I was like my co-host, Terry McDonald, who was a fantastic guy and taught me a lot about radio. He said, um, you're not in Kansas, Debbie. You know, you're not in Kansas anymore. You're you're in the big city of Seattle. And so, but so that shows you my level of um, naivete. So meanwhile, my mom was, my mom needed me to help her. And so I went back to Spokane and, you know, 
at one time in my life, I actually had considered becoming a nun. So I said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going <laughs> to. I'm have. sorry. That's funny to I me. Know. I don't. <laughs> I know, but I did. That's why I'm, it's kind of hilarious. So I go, I went to Seattle university to get a master's in, um, spirituality and it was a summer program. There were a lot of nuns and priests there, and it just took one summer with them that I knew I didn't want that life. <laughs> no, the same for me. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so I got I got back into I got it I got a job in communications in Spokane, and it was public relations for the Washington State Department of Game and Wildlife. And so I had to write and produce all of their PR and teach consultants in the state of Washington how to interact with the media. And I knew how to do that from my experience at the stations. So I kept that job, but it, I mean, I could get it done in like two hours a day until I was so bored I couldn't stand it. And I used all my sick leave and just all of a sudden, I mean, it just wasn't working. And so I go, God, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. So I called the small business administration in Spokane and I said, could you send somebody over to help me figure out what I want to do? Please help me. These jobs just keep being offered to me that I'm not interested in, that I'm just I know me. what was wrong with me. So, so now how did, this, how did you end up becoming a freelance voiceover actor? Well, okay, I had worked they so the idea of me having my own business came from the small administ business administration they sent over this man who had had a successful advertising agency in spokane and so i started working in advertising agencies as a writer and producer there were two agencies in in the spokane market and they were good size um campaigns i worked on and the first job that i did in voiceover as a talent paid and it got me into the union i had the account i was the creative writer and co-director for washington water power which is you know supplies all yeah. the energy and that's a big client to have as a voice actor it's a huge and i didn't you know i'm just like da, 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 da. but i i came up with this idea what the goal of the campaign was was to get um, consumers to stop using electricity for home heating and switch to natural gas because it was more plentiful and less expensive. So I worked with this guy, an animator there, and we, we came up with it, with this concept, like there's a lot of things that only electricity can do. I can't remember that. What was the line? It was like, I remember this, we had this little guy coming in this animated character. Do, 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 do. And I said, there are many things that electricity can do. And he turns his TV set, but turning on a TV set is not one of them. What maybe people don't know that we have lots of natural gas and very little elect electricity. So we want them to know that they should, you know, consider, you know, converting to natural gas and use electricity for things only electricity can do. That's kind of what it was. Yeah. Okay. So I knew now this is where the sexism comes in. These are all old, good old boys and conservative Spokane. They're not going to want a woman to read it, but I auditioned all kinds of men and I wasn't getting the read I wanted. I wasn't directing them right or whatever. So I recorded it. No, no, don't, it. don't take it on yourself. They just weren't giving you what you needed. I now I now I know that the empowered woman that I. <laughs> well, so so I recorded it on a cassette tape, and I said to the you know I said to the client. Oh, oh by um, the way, hold on. For those of you who don't know, a cassette tape was a, oh. <laughs> a way that we could record sound back in the old days. Yeah, the olden days. And so I played, I said, I know you you will, you'll want to hire a, a male voiceover person, but this is the feel that I'm looking for. See, Dave, you're bringing out the feelings in me. This is the feel that I want it to have. And they said, we want you to do it. And I was shocked. So I had that campaign. I was, I had, so I was able to conceive of the idea, write it, producer, be the voiceover talent on it. And I still have a letter that said the result of that campaign, they were 
they installed 319% more uh, natural gas installations than projected. They, that's how much we surpassed their quota. Do you remember the copy? Do you remember any of, of the lines? Do you remember what the read was like? I do. It was like, it was very, I was like, maybe people don't know this. Maybe people don't know that that um, there's a shortage in electricity and that we have abundant natural gas. That was my attitude with it. And we showed this little man trying to do different things that only electricity can do, like his hair, a hair dryer, you know, you not, and it, there's fire. You try to use natural gas with it and it goes, ah, and it was so, I, I'm trying so, to remember. So no, let me ask you this, was, was this the tipping point from, uh, I'm a broadcaster who writes and occasionally voices something to I am voiceover artist now. Yeah, and that that was, but where the final one came in, okay, let's see when, I did one other little thing in between. So the agencies had, the agency I was working for, as it happens in agencies, they lost several big accounts. And so I was on unemployment and I knew I was then 27 and I didn't want to stay in Spokane. So, um, I said the only, I mean, I'd done a lot of stuff creatively and I always did my highest level of work before I left that I really didn't understand business that well. So I went to work for Xerox and one of the girls that was the intern <laughs> <laughs> and I worked for Xerox as a sales executive. And then we came to a point and I saw so I put that I wanted for my career goal to be the advertising director of Xerox and I helped my boss. I put together this, this used copier sale, if you can imagine. <laughs> I, I helped him achieve this huge quota, which got him a promotion to be the general manager in Hawaii for Xerox. Oh. So he was paying so you, me back. You got him the promotion. Yeah, that's what he said. So he goes, now come in, Debbie. And what's, uh, oh, you wanted to be the creative director. I mean, you wanted to be the advertising director for Xerox. I can help make that happen for you. And I thought, no. <laughs> and then during, I, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm not, because guess what happened? Here's, here's the turning point. Here's the turning point where it all changed. Um, while I was at Xerox and I was in Seattle at a, there's a place called, it was Tower, Tower and Tower Records is what it was called. It was dur during the days of records and albums. Yeah, and, it was, <laughs> and it was crying, pouring down rain. And I went in and I was looking at the Frank Sinatra albums, you know, and then across on the other side of the aisle, somebody went, Debbie. And I went, Dick Worsinski. He was the general manager at the local ABC affiliate. And he was the first director I worked with at KHQ. Wow. Wow. He goes, what are you doing? And I go, oh, I don't, I really miss, I like learning about business, but I really miss voiceover and, and on camera stuff. And he goes, well, here's what you do. Do you have stuff of your old, you know, you have examples of your old stuff. You just put together a reel. And then this is a <laughs> shout out to Steve Lawson in Seattle. You go to Steve Lawson Productions, they'll help you put a demo together, and they have a list of people that you can go in contact with your demo. And Steve Lawson, I'm giving you a shout out, he um, gave me that list, and the first one on the list was Allied Stores, and it was for the Bon Marche, which is now owned by Macy's. So they hired me for an on-camera job of selling mattresses. <laughs> And so, so then they, they, they said, then they started giving me more on camera work. Well, during the day I'm working for Xerox. And then the next day people at Xerox would say, didn't I see you on TV last night? I said, no, don't, I don't, did you? I don't know. I think it's somebody else that looks like me, but I knew I was going to have to finally declare my major in life. Voiceover or, or at least, or, cam at, yeah, least yeah. Yeah. at least as a performer, as a performer. And that's when. I did. And it was the perfect time. And I said, I was about 30. Yeah, I was about 30, 31. And so I said, I'm just going to focus on on camera and voiceover. So um, that's when that happened. Okay. Now, 
So now you're really stepping into your voice over career. Um, when did you become this voice that just touches people's souls? How did that start to happen? Uh, what was the evolution of that? Because you really, uh, I remember the first time I heard uh, some of your narration work, and it was a number of years ago, and it was just amazing. Uh, how did you become that person? You know, I took a class with Maurice Tobias in narration, and she had Bill Ratner come in. Ah, two of my, well, Bill, close friend, and I've worked with yeah. Maurice. Yeah, and both excellent teachers, but I, you know, Bill Ratner was just incredible. I mean, he just, I just resonated with him. What did, what did Bill tell you? What's, what's the thing that Bill said that resonated with you? you need to have a slower pace when you're telling the story and to be really emotionally connected to the words and the naturalness of it to let your natural uh, kind of way that you talk to come forth anyway. So, I mean, I applied that and I, what, when I went to do the audition, Oh, I was offered this opportunity by Wendy Wills as a um, casting director at bad animals in Seattle. And it was for, oh, it was an emergency. It was like December 23rd. A client needed a scratch, a temporary scratch track put in. And it was for this thing called Return of the River, this documentary film, Return of the River. The girl, woman who's supposed to do it had a sore throat and they have to meet a deadline. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And then they kept me as the voice. And that really, and then I entered it in the Voice Arts Awards and only at the suggestion of my husband. Go Ken. I, was just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wasn't in, I was really wanted to support what they were doing. And the only thing, the only work I had up to that time that I thought I could enter would be my demo by Chuck Duran. And so I was a finalist in that category for, um, I think it was for promo, but. Um, well, let me, let me, let's, let's skip ahead a little bit. Yeah. On a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis now, what kind of work do you do the most? Is it mostly narration? I know you're working. At, are, are you doing uh, commercials? Um, I'll tell you. Um, so it's really all over the place. Today is, yeah, March 17th. Four years exactly today ago. So I do, I have been living in Los Angeles part-time with my daughter because my daughter went down to LA and she wants, she asked me to be her roommate. So I said, Ken said, yeah, you can be a roommate you can come back and forth. So I, we do have an apartment, you know, down in LA together and I will start going back during the pandemic, but um, I'm getting my, tell me, get me back on track, Dave. Okay. What kind of work are you doing mostly oh, now in voice? Yeah. Over? So a lot of it is uh, on the March 17th, I was helping my daughter look for things at Ikea to, for her apartment. And she was using my phone for a camera. And I saw this text come in from my manager that said, this you know production company wanted me to come in. I got this ADR job for Lynn Shane on Insidious 4. And I had to be there. And it was, Mar it was, it was March 17th. And I remember because um, it was at Buddha Jones in LA and I was, my daughter drove me down there and there was this guy with bright red hair and green suspenders. <laughs> and it was, I said, you must be Irish. He goes, I am. And so anyway, so I'll never forget it. I went in there and I'd never done ADR before. Yeah. I had not studied ADR either, but I just, they gave me Lynn Shane and I studied her and her mannerisms and I got the job and uh, it was three pages and it was in a room. I stood at the mic like that. And then the engineer was like where I was, but behind me was a couch where the director was. And so you're working to the like, beeps. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then the guy turned around like that to me and looked at me and he goes, you are really good at this. And I was shocked. It was my first ADR job. So, so I do so a lot of ADR. Basically, what you had to do was listen uh, to what it was, see, and 
Uh, you've got the script in front of you, so you've listened to the cadence of the actor in front, uh, and they play it back again, and boop, 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 and on the fourth, what would have been the fourth beep, you come yeah. in and replace that dialogue. Right. But you were and just so you were you were able to hear it, get the cadence down, m match the lip flap, and and do yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was really amazing because I'd never done that before. And then, um, so now I do a lot of ADR. I have done ADR for. Um, <laughs> why am I forgetting your name right now? Okay, somebody is asking the question. What's ADR? It's automatic dialogue replacement. And uh, this happens a lot in animation, in movies. Uh, oftentimes, you'll have an actor that uh, they need to replace some dialogue. They've either changed it or, or there was a technical problem. But the actor is someplace else and they can't get him. So they want to find somebody who can uh, imitate that actor, give, give the, the, the feel, the voice of that actor, and come in and you're watching the screen. Uh, and you heard what the actor did, you're seeing what the lip flap is, you've got the words in front of you, and you hear those three beeps. They play it back after a few times of your checking it out, and boop, boop, boop. And on what would be the fourth beep, that's when you're coming in. That's, that's uh, ADR, automatic dialogue replacement. Yeah. And so I do that, and... I just got a booking for tomorrow for commercial. And um, so I am doing some commercial. I don't, I just do a lot of different things. I did a, a big job for an international company that is doing, I can't disclose, but it's, it's a worldwide Zoom cast um, thing. Yeah, let me ask you, where does most of your work show up? Are you doing work that is showing up um, in corporate nair, not necessarily broadcast and broadcast. Uh, you're doing a variety of things. Uh, yeah, I am doing trailer and trailer for like this. I just did one for, um, it was called The Craft Legacy for Sony. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're doing movie trailers? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are not a lot of women doing movie trailers. There's not even really a lot of guys doing movie trailers. So this is really a breakthrough. Thank goodness it's it's uh, March and uh, uh, Women's History Month. So thank you. Bravo. And, and you're you're so down to earth with this. Uh, and by the way, if you have a question uh, for Debbie, please uh, put it in. I'm, I'm going to bring one up now. Michael Haskins question for Miss Harada. Uh, what was your learning curve uh, regarding technology, the equipment you use, computer audio interface, and mastering it? Michael, that is the question of the day. Okay, how we started, because I was not an engineer, my son, who is 23 and an artist and needed a supplemental income, is very good at technology. And so he was trained to use Pro Tools, and he recorded me. And we, he did that for three years, and then he was going to go to New York, um, which he did. And then I hired another engineer to work with me. And because I really like it with engineers, I really love hiring an engineer because then you can just do what you want at my fast. Well, it just became like that's not going to be sustainable. So I enrolled in a class on how to learn Pro Tools. It was basically to be certified in Pro Tools to get this Pro, Pro Tools certification. Tw Twisted Wave wasn't available then? Well, you know, I knew everybody used Pro Tools and my, you know, so I just went Pro, Pro Tools. Tools. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, this is another miraculous thing that happened, Dave. Okay, so I go in and I'm like, I, I, I called the, the head of the school. I go, I'm really nervous about this because with technology, I learn it, I understand it. And then it's like a sieve. It just, I forget it all. She goes, I go, I said, no, I'm really afraid. I'm not going to learn this. And she goes, well, I, Alex, the teacher, he is a very good teacher. And I promise you, you will get what you want out of this class. And even if we only have one student, because it was coming up on a Memorial Day weekend, we will teach you. And it turned out I was the only student. 
I was raising my hand. I have a question. And then finally, uh, we got to the point where he said, well, you're not going to be certified in Pro Tools, but I'm going to give you what you need to know to do what you need to do. <laughs> and so... We, <laughs> Well, so, uh, you're not going to be working for studios, but uh, no, right. we'll get you. So you'll be able to record exactly. yourself and do a little uh, uh, editing. <laughs> yeah. So we were talking back and forth and I was asking him, I said, is there a better place to park where I was parking? Because it was not really safe. But he goes, I ride my bike, so I don't know. And I go, well, where do you live? He goes, West Seattle. And I go, I live in West Seattle. Where do you I'll give you Seattle? a ride. If... <laughs> no, but guess you won't believe what happened. He lives. He goes. We live above, above the ferry. I go. I live above the ferry. He goes on Roxbury and Forty Second. I go. I live on Forty Second. You live a half a block from me. He lived one half a block. So he would walk up and help me really learn it. Oh wow, wow! You and know even what? to this day, you, you he know lets what? me call him. The angels are following oh, you around and helping you. Okay, I got another question here from J. Horace Black. Are you getting most of your work through your manager or agent or a combination of both? Really wonderful hearing the continual uncommon favor that has been upon you. And I praise God and thank him for that. Thanks for that question or comment, Jay. I really appreciate that. Um. Mostly for my agent and manager. I'm yeah. represented by Atlas and Jason Mark's talent, but those I get most of my work. I will get, a, I have a, still have a few regional jobs that I do. Like I do the voice for Mercedes Benz of Sugarland, Texas. Sugarland, Texas. Yep. And, um, well, you know, I was doing Claws promos which clauses was a TNT show that mm -hmm. had oh, yeah. stopped filming during the pandemic, but they are going to have their fourth and final season probably late this summer. So I'll be back on the air again for a while. Excellent. Excellent. But the, those quote trailers, they were, they were put on Instagram for this. All of them were on Instagram and they were 15 second trailers. What, and you know what? Uh, the world is very different now because of technology and all the I different know. platforms. So, but still, you are doing <laughs> movie trailers as a woman, and that's huge. Thank uh, you. Oh, and Horace had another comment. You need to play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my husband says. <laughs> that's right, Jay. Oh, boy. And, and, and still, if you have some other questions. Um, well, so what, let me ask you this. What would you say the secret to your success is? What is it that what is it about your read that you think is special? Now, oh, that I'm just really coming into that in my older years here. Um, there it's really more about being in touch with my inner self. And when I read the words, like you said, you give some people words and they don't read them, but you, the words are there. There's these marks on these paper that are creating ideas and you have to get what the ideas mean. And meaning is used generally has an emotional connection to it. So that's really what I do when I get the copy. I just think more, you know, always of my audience. And if it's, really well written i can get it. if it's poorly written it's really hard to bring the right emotion <laughs> you but, you have you have been a, a writer um throughout your career do you right. think that do you think that helps with your voiceover i think it does i think it does but you know really and truly i didn't know this about myself to talk about late bloomer so late self awareness but i've been an i'm an empath which means i really feel a lot of different things i've always been extremely sensitive and so I pick up on feelings in all kinds of different ways. But when I'm focusing it on the story, you know, it comes forth and then I just connect with it. And then I move my mouth and make the sounds that correspond with the, with the words. Move my mouth and make the sounds that correspond with the words. <laughs> well, I, 
Okay. I'm taking I'm... singing lessons now. And uh, that's what, you know, so, so you have to bring things up to your vocal cords from your breath. Uh huh. Oh yeah. And then, you know, and so basically I'm really getting, that's why I'm like really in how sound is well, created. I, I, I really truly believe, um, and I, I say this in my voiceover classes for, uh, video games, the words are only there to remind us of what we're saying is one thing, and their only importance is they give to tail the tale of what your character's thinking and feeling. So there, yeah. it's really not about the words. It's about everything behind the words, the thoughts and the right. feelings of, of your character. Uh, and you're saying that you are an empath um, I think that comes through. In the work that I hear from you, uh, I there is a subtlety, there is a connection with just saying it, but it's just thick with what you're thinking and feeling. Um, a lot of people get lost in uh, when you, and I remember early in my career in voice where uh, I was trying to get rid of the DJ thing. And a director would say, oh, just say it a little more. And I didn't understand what they meant. Uh, because uh, what they meant was not to be devoid of thought and feeling. It was, don't try to make the words do a dance. Don't, uh, don't give them something. Don't do the sing-song thing. Just say it from your heart and from your thinking. Right. And out it comes. And the less I worry about, uh, you know, what should I do with this word? What should I do with right. this word? The, the more honest the read comes out. That's it. It's the honesty. It's the honesty of the words. And that was really what Bill Ratner connected me to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Bill, um, I, I'm, and thank you, because I remind you, I don't have to get Bill on. Yeah, he's awesome. We, we we have been uh, very good friends for a long time. Haven't seen him in a while. Uh, yeah. But uh, he, he's a great guy. Great guy. He is. He is. So what would you tell someone uh, new to the game uh, that's uh, trying to get their voiceover career going? Uh, what do you think some of the best advice uh, for that person might be? Uh, I, to get a foundation in acting is really important. Um, I, I mean, I, I have taken more acting classes in Seattle, it was through Freehold Theater. And I had a really wonderful teacher who said, uh, I, this is probably from Meisner or somebody else, but um, it's acting is being truthful in an imaginary circumstance. So when I got, she, she would let, she would have, so be truthful, come to your truth about something, uh, about what, whatever it is that you're there. Thinking you're or going feeling what connect. you're experiencing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then be truthful in this imaginary circumstance. Like, you know, you have to actually, if you need to say like, pretend that this is happening in your life and how do you honestly feel about it? And then just be truthful and read the copy and i mean you say read the, the copy, word the words are there but what you really have to be truthful about are what you're thinking and feeling right um uh, uh, how how are you how would you be reacting in this moment uh, i've got another question here well jay you're just coming up with the questions man you're saving the day jay <laughs> uh, what's your process uh of approaching copy dave does the three and three and i'll tell you what that is in a minute do you okay. have a simple one two three type of approach or some template that you apply Oh, my three on three is just to acquaint you with what the words that you're saying. Uh, so often, especially when we're uh, sight reading um, or, you know, you're not memorizing anything, you're caught, you're, you're losing the thought and feel of it by getting caught in the reading of it. It takes a certain right. amount of brain power to see those words have them filter back into your head, come out, and then come out of your mouth. And the more um, those are just at the ready, that they're just reminding you that they're there, 
as opposed to I am reading these words and there's you know, now the next line. Uh, the more you can give of your heart and your head uh, to the copy. Um, so he's asking, do you have a simple one, two, three type of approach or some template that you apply when you're approaching a piece of copy? Um, yeah, and I can. I want to credit Jody Gottlieb, who's also a great voiceover coach. She just um, she just has me read, just read the words. Do, it's just like a she calls it a mumble. Do a mumble read. Yeah. So you just read what they're and familiarize yourself with the words, and then imagine yourself uh, being the receiving person of this message. What would you want to hear? This is my part. Um, this there's one here that there's one that this was a bunch of girls watching television shows together and they're much younger and they're trying to keep up. So I had to imagine like I'm talking to these girls like, oh, you want to see this? You want to see that? And just be truthful with it. Well, now you can because there's this big thing coming up on television where you can get this, this, this and this. And so I read the words, I did a mumble, I imagined the audience and my relationship to the audience. And then I brought that into the uh, performance. And you can, then I just, you know, I do, you do that a couple of times until it just feels really natural. Yeah, yeah. I like you mentioning of the mumble because that's part of my three and three, three times in your head and three times just oh, right. mum, mumbling the words. It, it's right. amazing how much you want uh, the physicality there. Right. Uh, and, of course, physicality, all of that. Uh, right. I've uh, got another comment here from Trey. Uh, uh, for any young lady listening who may not be having the success they want in VO, what would you say to keep them encouraged? That their voice matters. And that's the thing you have to... This young woman needs to know there's only one of her in the world and your voice is your God given birthright and you were given it to use it. And all the societal or cult cultural or sex sexist attitudes or racist attitudes towards that does not do anything to the truth. And so you've got to stay with it. You have to believe in yourself that you were created and you, and it's the truth. There's only one you, and you just have to say, I have to be me. I only have one life and I am going to stay with this. And I'd say, stay with it and do whatever comes presents itself to you. Because if you put an intention that you want to get better, different things will come to you and bec become sensitive to those things that come. Like you might read something like, oh, that appeals to me. I think I'll take that class, do it. And then do it to your very best ability and don't worry about being perfect, but just do it to the best of your ability and just keep doing that over and over and over and over again. There, there's a, so much truth in that, exposing yourself to things that you're interested in uh, that maybe this is not gonna be your lifelong goal, but you have no idea how it's gonna help you along. Um, exactly. Ellen, um, what would your dream voiceover be, Deb? Oh, Ellen, she's a dream of a voiceover talent. Um, I think I've, I've fulfilled a lot of my dreams. Everything that comes to me is really a dream come true. And it's not, I, I, I'm going to share at the end of this, when we're all done, I'm going to put a link on your comment page, Dave, to this. Okay. To something to something I did in 2015, and it was for a um, a friend of mine who's a choreographer, amazing cho choreographer, Jovan Miller, and he asked me to. He wrote this script called Elemental War, and it was a dance that he created. He choreographed about the elements fighting, and so he gave me the script and he asked me to read it. And so I put my emotion into that and he sent the music along with it too. So I had the words and the music and I recorded it and I sent it back to him. He listened to it and he got a feeling out of it and he played it for his entire dance troupe and they practiced. So there was feeling upon feeling upon feeling. And so then we, they did a live performance and they, 
dance to the recording that I did mm -hmm. over the loudspeaker in a live performance. So you get the feelings of the live performance with all that adrenaline and kind of, you know, stage fright, but all that practice and all that feeling that they've been putting into it. But now this is the dancer's final spin. Yeah. That was, and, and then you're there as a live audience. Oh my God, it was just like an immediate, everybody stand stood up. And it was just in a small theater here in Seattle, but um, Jovan Miller, and I'm gonna put a link to that dance and it's with his young, they were just young teenagers. And some of the dancers in there are, I mean, it's exquisite. And it's so that really was for me, uh, really a dream come true and and i did it you know for not very much money but um i really like doing trailer work and i like doing anything meaningful really is a dream come true yeah i got uh let's see michael haskins and uh, because we have uh we're just one minute after seven now oh i'm sorry nope 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 you're all right you're all right michael haskins how do we get in touch with you miss harada at my website, debbieherrada.com. And that's D-E-B-B-E. -E. Right. Because Debbie <laughs> is spelled so many doggone ways. And you're not the only Debbie Harada out there. Yeah. In fact, my sister-in-law is a Debbie Harada. Does she spell it the same? I-E. Oh, I so see. See? D D E B B E H I R A T A dot com. And my email is on there and you can email me. All right. Well listen. Bravo, bravo, bravo. I love uh, being here with you, Dave. It's oh, always it, a treat. It's my pleasure. You know, you're you're one of my favorite voices. Uh, and I'm not talking about the voice. I'm talking about your read. Your reads are so soulful and connecting and grounded in in thought and feeling. Uh, and every time I hear you, it's that. Thank uh, you, David. That's a huge compliment. Well, it's 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 just true. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. And, and uh, I feel the same way about your work. I mean, oh. I met, I heard Dave do the live announce at the first Voice Arts Awards, which was absolutely incredible. And then I, I, I mean, I was so shocked about everything. And then I connected with you again at the next one in LA. And I mean, I still didn't really know this little world that I was in. It took time. And then I actually, you know, I came to know your work and had you coach me and We'll have to pick up on that. Well, again, and and, but... and you're a great student, and and I think that's a part of what you were talking about. Dip your toe in a lot of different water. Um, take in a lot of different experiences. I tell people all the time: Look, yeah, do some training with me, but train with other coaches too. Uh, whatever uh, genre interests you at a particular time, do some training with that. But I'm going to let you go, so uh, you, can, everybody else you, go. You, can, you can have your dinner <laughs> and, and, and tell your husband, Ken, I said hello. And, I uh, will, and your wife, Mo. I will do that, and you take care, and I will be Thank glad you, when this pandemic is over and oh. the voiceover community and friends of mine like you, uh, we can get together again and break bread and have a drink and talk and laugh and uh, love I one another. I know. I can't wait. All right. Thank you, Debbie Harada. And, Thank uh, you. I will see you soon. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. And uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I, I, you, you have experienced a, a great talent there who's very humble and clearly... <laughs> uh, very favored uh, by the powers that be. Uh, once again, you want uh, uh, voiceover training with me, DaveFinoy.com. Click on the, the uh, study voiceover tab. And if you'd like to review this or any other Ask Dave Finoy anything, you can go to my YouTube channel, Dave Finoy Voiceover Training. And I will see you next week. And uh, it should be J. Michael Collins. Of course, he lives in Europe. So got to make sure oh, wow. he's going to be awake for it. 
Uh, and <laughs> in the meantime, book something. <laughs> <laughs>